pick it on. We good? Okay. Well, guys, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be here tonight. It's, a, it's an honor. I know um, Calder asked me to share a little bit about what uh, my past has been, and uh, there was a little bit of curiosity as to how I got the name Chicken Man. Well, I, uh, my heart's desire was to, was to be a farmer. I actually went to the University of Georgia on, on an agricultural scholarship. And uh, after I finished uh, college, I got into the heavy equipment business and uh, stayed in it for 20 years, but I also uh, farmed as well. And uh, so, can you? Mike's not on? Okay. Mm. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing one, two, three, four. Can you hear me? <laughs> No? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you, can you hear me now? Uh, uh. Anyway, um, <clears throat> as I was um, working in the corporate world for, for 20 years and I got into farming and then I was uh, fortunate enough to, to get out of it. Uh, in 1990 and I went into farming full time and uh, but a tornado came along in 1998 and blew it all away but uh, the reason why I have as, now you can hear me a little better uh, uh, can, can we get rid of this well that's okay I'm, I'm good I'm good okay. but um, anyway uh, as, as I got out of uh, the corporate world and thought I was going to farm full time. Um, I, um, I, I raised uh, 150,000 chickens, uh, had 2,000 hogs all the time, and uh, had about 150 head of cattle. And uh, so I was uh, producing anywhere from 750,000 to 900,000 chickens a year. And a good friend of mine, when, when I met him, you may know him as Jeff Foxworthy, he uh, hung the name Chicken Man on me when we first met. And uh, so, but, but you know, I, I, I loved farming, I worked hard at it, and uh, you know, when you, when you raise that many chickens a year, you pretty well get a PhD in chicken shit, if I can say that. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I, I do have a, a lot of knowledge of that, but uh, uh, the Lord uh, saw fit to uh, send that tornado along and got me out of it. And, I uh, went back and got my master's, and I am now a counselor, and I have been counseling for uh, 13 years uh, for uh, my life's, um, you know, career, ministry, everything that God's given me, and uh, and it's been a real privilege because I, um, uh, I enjoy being outdoors. I love to hunt and fish a lot, and... Uh, I've got a lot in, in common with men because of just, just what I've experienced in my life. And, uh, and so because of that, I, I get a lot of men who, who come in and uh, we get to talk through a, a lot of different things in their life issues to try to help them uh, get through them and grow and, and be the kind of men that especially uh, that, that where Jesus Christ can be seen in you. And uh, that is uh, primarily my, my heart's passion. And, uh, and that's what I wanted to speak to you t tonight about. Uh, I, I am old fashioned, so um, uh, we'll use something called um, a, a Bible. And uh, uh, in, in a way that a, a lot of people don't use it like that anymore. But. Uh, my, my focus tonight, and uh, I appreciate Calder getting me such a tall stand here tonight, uh, <laughs> especially, especially when you're 6'3 and you get to do this, but, uh, uh, but I, just to be honest with you, uh, I, I really almost agonized on uh, you know, what would be most beneficial to you guys as I share tonight, because I want to share my heart, but I... I I want to share something that uh, is going to be meaningful to you, and uh, uh, I really wanted to talk to you about the personality that God wants you to have, and and how you can be the kind of man where where you make the difference. But uh, 
but it just he just changed my direction to um, and let me look at the clock because I, I I'll get long winded here, but uh, uh, to to talk to you t- tonight about Christianity costing you something because there, there's a lot about Christianity that that's a, a, a wonderful experience but. Jesus very much uh, wants us to know some things about the cost of, of being in the battle that belongs to the Lord instead of the one that belongs to you. But if you've got a Bible with you, if you'd like to look it up on your phone, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and this is where Jesus is beginning to uh, speak uh, to, to His disciples. And uh, the, the, the definition of, of disciple is, is a follower of Jesus. And it's very important to know that, that we, we begin our journey that, that way. And, and this is where um, we're able to, um, to see ourselves in, in what Christ is saying to us. This, this scripture certainly applies to your life even if you aren't a follower of Jesus, but, but I hope you'll, you will consider you know, what, what this word can say to you as well. But when we take a look, and, and I'm going to read through this scripture, it says, when, uh, when Jesus saw the crowds, in verse 1, and this is Jesus beginning what's called the Sermon on the Mount, that he preached around an area north of Jerusalem in an area called uh, the, the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. And uh, excuse me for stumbling, but I'll be 68 on Monday, so you can tell why I stumble a little bit. Uh, but when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I, I want to stop right there and, and begin to, to help you get a perspective of what Jesus is saying to us. And, and the first word that he throws out there in speaking to his disciples, his followers, is this word blessed. It shows the lights on. Test, test. Hmm. Test. No, oh, there. Okay. okay. All right. That sounds good. One of the things that Jesus wants us to see in this word blessed is this is a term that you would want to hear. Because as soon as you heard this term, what are you thinking of? You're thinking of the blessing that you would basically receive from a father figure, because my son's sitting here tonight. and. Um, and, and, and that blessing says, here's a meaningful touch on your life that says, you have my favor. And Jesus was wanting to see in this blessing that there's something that he's saying that his Father wants us to know where first of all, this is a meaningful touch that I put on your life that says, you have my favor. When you realize what? What poverty of spirit is. Because you want to be able to see that your spirit is made up of two very important things, your heart and your will. And your heart's your ability to love and be loved. Your will's your decision maker. And Jesus, right out of the gate, say it to his disciples, I'm blessing you that with, with you being able to know that your Father's letting you see this about yourself, that you've got poverty in your spirit. There's a sense about what's going on in my heart because of how I've lived and who I am in people 
that you basically got a heart that you're living to protect from any more pain, shame, and guilt, and you want to see this about yourself. And when you do see this about yourself, then Jesus wants to take you on a journey of growth and the progression in these Beatitudes. Well, then when you see this about yourself, the next thing Jesus says is, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And what Jesus is saying, when you see this about yourself, nobody else can comfort you and grow you through this other than the one who created your heart. Are you with me in that? Yeah. This is something that Jesus wants you to know about how you've lived your life out. And guys, you know what it's like to carry around a lot of pain, a lot of shame, a lot of guilt. And then as you get blessed and you see this about yourself as a follower of Jesus and then you mourn over that, the only one who can comfort you in that is the one who created your heart. But what do we do? We go to other created people and things trying to get some way of, of, of getting relief from that. And Jesus says, as you mourn, now you can be comforted, but we're the only ones who can. And then when we accept that, that comforting, then Jesus goes on to say, uh, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. And here's where Jesus is saying, there's something that changes when you realize the poverty that's going on in your own heart and will. I'll basically say this takes you on a journey of how I'm trying to perfect learning how to play defense. And then as I begin to, to mourn over the things that, that I've done in my life, and I didn't share you know, much of my past b before I got into it, but I was addicted to porn for 18 years, and I was a very sexually immoral man before I came to know Christ. And in that, did I have a lot of poverty of spirit? Yes, I did. Even as I came to know Christ, I was still struggling with a lot of that pain, a lot of that shame, a lot of that guilt. And as I mourned, I began to see the only one who could comfort me is, is the one who created my heart. And Jesus is wanting you to see that so that then you're able to see there's a, there's a gentleness that begins to happen. There's a meekness. There's a humility that begins to take place in how you see your world so that you want you can inherit the earth because what happens before that? You can work in your ass off trying to get it for yourself. And then when you get it, what really happens? It owns you instead of you owning it. And that happens to so many men and that's happening in, in, in this room here today in the way that you're living out your life. And Jesus is trying to teach you. Your Heavenly Father wants to give this to you so that you can be able to let it be part of that inheritance and Him blessing you with, with His favor so that what you have can be that which you own out of who you are in Him instead of it owning you out of who you are in it. Then as we begin to, to, to see this progression, then Jesus moves us into verse 6 where He says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied or be filled. And here Jesus is using the term of that which I'm, I, I hunger for food. I, I thirst for, for, for water. And so as I hunger and thirst, and Jesus is teaching us, there's a sense about this spiritual aspect where righteousness is not so much a right standing before God as your Father, but a right relationship with your Father where you grow into having what? A heart-to-heart -heart relationship with the one who created your heart. Then as you begin to, to experience you know, what this is like, then there's an aspect of, of, a, of a feeling here because now the one who's created my heart is wanting to meet the need of my heart. Now I can begin to grow how? Spiritually, in, in, in that way that um, there's a, a feeling, that, that there's a satisfaction there that then moves us into uh, verse 7 where it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And, 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 and what is mercy? Mercy is where I'm not getting what I do deserve. Now grace is where I get what I don't deserve. But mercy is so important where I begin to be able to, to, to walk in that aspect of since I'm not getting what I do deserve, 
then there's a sense of where I don't want to be a dispenser of throwing things people on, on giving them what I think they deserve. I'm not going to give them what they do deserve. And the person that you're usually hardest on in trying to protect this is yourself. And there's a sense of what Jesus is saying in this blessing is allow yourself to be merciful to yourself. There's a sense of where you're not getting what you do deserve because you believe in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for you. And Jesus is trying to teach them that as a follower that I, I am the Lamb of God who's going to take away your sin. And so as he's preparing them to, to, to walk in this, and they see this sense of being merciful to themselves, and then they begin to, to grow in, in seeing that, that I'm not getting what I do deserve. And as you begin to look at how this applies in, in, in Scripture, there's an aspect, especially in 2 Corinthians 4, 1, it talks about you begin to do ministry. Why? Because of mercy. I'm not going to get what I do deserve. And I know I deserve it. But this aspect of not getting it is that which can, can, can motivate me into what Jesus then goes on to tell us in verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's a sense of what Jesus is wanting us to begin to do as we progress from, from poverty of spirit, then we mourn and the one who meets the need of our heart begins to, to, to then sit, let us see this comfort. And then, then there's that sense of where as, as I mourn and, and, and I get comforted, then, then Jesus then moves us into this aspect of being able to, to relate to the things of this earth where He gives it to you instead of you giving it to yourself. And then this aspect of, of as I grow into righteousness, as I'm hungry and thirsty for this, and I begin to have a sense of being satisfied, being filled in this, that then I begin to show that mercy, especially to myself, where, where I, I, I'm not going to give myself what I think I deserve and, and as far as my own punishment, or I'm, I, I'm being able to see that because I'm not getting what I do deserve, then I'm able to show that mercy to other people and how I live out my life. And, and, and then as we see this, this purity of heart and we begin to see God, then this aspect of how I share my heart and how I begin to see God, then God allows you to begin to see the heart of other people. There's a sense of where we're so reactive because we're trying to protect our hearts that we're, that we're busy reacting to what we see and hear physically. And what Jesus is trying to grow us into is be able to see what's going on spiritually. I think if you're married, you probably got a wife that would really like to see you get an idea about what's going on in her heart sometime. Okay, you say that's impossible. Oh, no, it's not. Okay. And, uh, uh, but as we have this purity of heart and we begin to see what's going on in, in other people as we see God and God lets us begin to see other people, then here's a very important thing that Jesus then gives to us. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. When you've got peace with God, you help other people have peace with God, and then people see something in you that ties in with purpose on tap. Because the main purpose that God has for you is for you to be like Jesus Christ. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You look like Jesus Christ when you do this. And what a tremendous blessing that is. But then Jesus moves us into then <clears throat> a different perspective where now He wants us to see. It's going to cost us something. In verse 10, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says, I want you to know there's a blessing to you because guess what? You're going to get persecuted. And why would you get persecuted? Because you're rightly related to the one who created your heart. And in being able to do so, the things that you begin to do in living that out will bring persecution into your life. And then Jesus says, here's what else what I want you to know in verse 11. 
Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all evil, all kinds of evil against you because of me. Jesus goes on to say, well, guess what? You're going to be persecuted, you're going to be insulted, and you're even going to be lied about. And as you experience that, then I know this is what you've been doing all along in verse 12. Rejoice and be glad. Or is that what you're doing? Because there's a reality to this that you want to be able to see that what is costing me makes me be able to not only have this heart that's changing where I can share it, but to have joy that lets me have rejoy and rejoicing because of this being something that's worth paying the price for. But what does this usually do to you when people start making fun of you for being a Christian or going and hanging out on Wednesday night at Purpose on Town? What does it do to you when you begin to try to make a stand in the corporate world and they begin to say, hey, I, 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 I think you're a little bit strange, you're a little bit too far out there. I, I, I think we need to consider somebody else you know, for, for this position. We're not so sure we want to have this kind of leadership in our business. And it's very easy for us to move back into that defensive perspective and then we wind up living at that defensive Christianity where I just go back to holding on to what I got left. Now I want to, if you got your Bible, please turn with me over to Revelation 3. In verse 20. The context of Revelation 3 and chapter 2 is where the Holy Spirit's writing to us through, through the hand of John about the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus calls his church his bride. When Jesus is teaching us in Matthew chapter 5, He's teaching us as His disciples, as His followers. But as we move fast forwarding into, as, as the church began to grow, it began to be established, there's seven, in church, seven churches that it talks about that's in, in the area of Turkey today. In those seven churches, at the time of, of when John was writing, were beginning to, to face a lot of challenges where if, if you read about them, one of the seven churches, only one of them, what was really what you'd say, oh, they got it going on. The other six were struggling and struggling mightily. And in Revelation 3, as Jesus is sharing us this with us, especially verse 20 that I want to read, he's referring to the church at Laodicea. And the church at Laodicea is a church that had a lot of wealth. They had a booming banking business. They had a thriving textile business. And then they had a very prosperous medical business where there was a special mineral there that they made an ointment that they used for eye salve. And the people who were Christians there were benefiting from that which is a lot like what our world is. And in having that blessing, what Jesus says to them here 
is here's what I want you to know about yourselves. You have gotten complacent. These things where you got persecuted, insulted, and lied about have brought you to a place of where you've gotten lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. And Jesus says, I want to spew you out of my mouth. And then Jesus says to us in verse 20, as Jesus is speaking to us as His church. Now, let me go back. Jesus refers to His church as His what? His bride. He refers to us as disciples in Matthew chapter 5. We start out as followers, but whether you want to admit it or not, Jesus wants to be in a relationship with you where He's the husband and you as His church are His bride. Well, what does that mean? If you're married, do you want your wife to be a follower of you? Or do you want her to be married to you? Well, what difference does that make? Uh, I like the intimacy of being married a whole lot more than I would want my wife to just be a follower of me. And in that intimacy that we have as a church, that Jesus shows up and says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. What do you think Jesus might be knocking on the door of? Your heart. Why would He want to knock on the door of your heart? Especially if you've gone lukewarm. Especially where you've gone kind of cold. Why would He knock on the door of your heart? Because He wants to come in and dine with you and you with Him. And He says, as I stand at the door and knock, if anyone hears my what? Voice. Jesus doesn't knock like that. Jesus is knocking, calling your name. He wants to have that kind of relationship with you where you hear Him talk to you as His bride and says, will you open up the door? If you will open up the door, I want to come in and dine with you and you with me. Well, why is that important? Because it lets you experience something as a Christian that I personally believe very few Christians know. Because one of the things that I very much like to teach is the concept of love that gives you joy and peace. It's the first three of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. A lot of the folks that I get around say you're like a broken record talking about LJP. But guess what every man in this room is looking for? Love, joy, and peace. And guess what gets in the way of you being able to know that? A heart that's got pain, shame, and guilt in it. Does that make sense? And when Jesus knocks on the door of your heart, Jesus is saying, I want to dine with you and you and me. You, you ever been to a, a, a covered dish supper? You know what I'm talking about? At an old church homecoming type meeting? Have you ever done dinner on the grounds at all? Is anybody old enough to know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. Well, I want to tell you something. Everybody brings a, a covered dish where they have made I call it built some of the best groceries you'll ever put in your mouth. What they bring that's in that dish is something that you can't help but enjoy. And when you go to that dinner on the grounds, covered dish meal, you take two things to that. You better bring some groceries. You better bring some food. 
But the second thing you get to bring is your appetite. And as Jesus says, I want to dine with you and you with me. Jesus knows the covered dish that you're bringing is the pain, shame, and guilt that's in here. And Jesus knows that you got an appetite for what? The love that gives me joy and peace that only comes from Him. He's the one who created it. He's the only true source of it. And He says, as I dine with you, I know you're hungry for my love, joy, and peace. And then we're so glad as we got that aspect of an appetite. Oh, thank you for bringing this because I'm hungry for this. But here's what, what I beg you to hear me tonight. We rarely realize that Jesus is just as hungry for your pain, shame, and guilt as you are for His love, joy, and peace. And because you don't know that, you wind up carrying around a lot of pain, shame, and guilt that you don't have to. Christians are the only people on this planet who get the privilege through spiritual growth, spiritual maturity, of being able to grow to where I realize I don't have to carry this around anymore. Does this make any sense? Jesus is just as hungry for your pain, shame, and guilt as you are love, joy, and peace. And until you give it up, you really ain't got room for LJP. But if you do, you got room for LJP and it changes how you live out your life because of how now I learn to do what? Live with a heart that's broken that I can share instead of a wounded one that I've been living all my life to protect. Does this make any sense? Now, if this does make any sense, I got an expensive Arby's sack today. My office manager went to Arby's and got lunch for me today. And in this, I got some armbands. Now, if everybody wants one, there ain't going to be enough for everybody. And so that's the reason why I'm putting them here because I want you to know the guy who's talking to you tonight wears one 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this little armband has love, joy, and peace on it. And if this makes any difference to you, then what I'm going to give you the opportunity to do is I want to pray, and if you want to come up here and get you a LJP armband to begin to connect to this, then you, it'll be your time to come forward and grab you one. If not, that's okay too. But after you do, then I want to share with you something about what this can mean to you based upon what I have shared with you. Lord Jesus, thank you. for what you want to do in this time about help, helping men connect to the true source of love, joy, and peace. There's a lot of guys like me that had a lot of things in their life that gave them joy and peace and they loved the way it made them feel. But it caused them not to open their heart to just do a better job of protecting it, living a game of defense and living a game of manipulation. And you, you want to grow some guys up tonight by letting them know where love, joy, and peace really comes from. To help them begin to have a heart that walks in this truth that Jesus is sharing with us that, that gives us freedom. 
So Lord, I ask you to, to move across hearts that want to experience this love, joy, and peace by them coming and getting an armband if they'd like to have one in Jesus' name. Amen. open. The door's open. Uh, anybody that wants an armband, I want you to come get one. I want you to come now. Okay, guys, let me have your attention so we can kind of draw this thing to a close. Um, goodness, I've spoken way too long. I want you to put that armband on if you got one. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Part of what I also want you to know is most of us have experienced the fruit of the flesh, which is pain, shame, and guilt. I see the day with fear, anger, and anxiety, where I live out my life in fight, flight, and freeze. And Jesus wants to free you up. My one, you know it where love, joy, and peace come from. And one of the things that I do every morning, I don't care where I'm at, I don't care what kind of time of day it is, I don't care if I'm in Arkansas or duck hunting and I'm getting up at 3 a.m. and the room's full of guys, I'm gonna go to the bathroom and I'm gonna get on my knees and I'm going to pray. Oh Jesus, I really want the Holy Spirit to work with you, to grow my spiritual senses, to hear you knock on the door of my heart this morning so we can have breakfast together. And I really want to give you the pain, shame, and guilt that you showed to me and some I know I got because I screw up royally many days. And I thank you that I can give that to you because you're hungry for it. And now I know you're going to give me love, joy, and peace. It gives me a heart that I can share. I can have the offensive game to be in a battle that belongs to you, even if I get insulted, persecuted, and lied about today. And I do that with my first waking moment. The guys that are in the Bible study have heard me share this many times. And I'd like to share with you an added benefit to this. A few years back, we were at a New Year's Eve party, my wife and I were, and one of the ladies pulled my wife aside and said, hey, Ronnie goes out to Arkansas and hunts by himself a lot. How do you know he ain't got a chick on the side out there? And she says, well, let me share something with you about my husband. His first waking moment every day 
I see him get on his knees. And I know what he's doing. He's connecting for love, joy, and peace, but also to be able to save the day, see the day with patience, kindness, and goodness instead of fear, anger, and anxiety so I can have the heart and mind of Christ. But the one thing I know about my husband when he's doing that is he's dying to go pee. <laughs> And she said, the very first thing I see my husband do every day is tell his body, no, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to tell you what to do. We're going to pray before anything else happens to connect with who I am in Christ as I begin my day. That's an added benefit to what living this out can do for you. Now the reason why I had this made out of stretchy material, have you got it on? Do you have it on your wrist? Now let's say you get out here in traffic on the Interstate 85 or 75 or 285 or 400 and somebody cuts you off. Guess what you'll lose almost immediately? Your love, joy, and peace. And the reason why I had these made out of stretchy material is so you can <laughs> to remind yourself of what? I just stepped out of who I am in you, Jesus, to who I am in people, and I'm looking to good traffic for my love, joy, and peace instead of you. Thank you for the pain that reminds me of what's about to set back up in here to where I go back into that which I don't want to go to, where I'm living in who I am in people instead of you. Does that make any sense? Okay, guys. Thank you all for listening to me tonight.